Hi, my name is Yulia Kriskovitz, and I'm a, a Feldenkrais practitioner based in DC area and also uh, a new member of the Feldenkrais Guild communications team. We have a monthly publication called Sensibility and our March issue is dedicated to sexual well-being. I'm really excited to introduce our guest, Irene Lyon. I have been following her with keen interest for a while um, and really would like to know what she thinks about the subject matter. Um, she is a, a somatic experiencing practitioner. She has studied with uh, you know, all the bigs in the somatic <laughs> world. She's also uh, studied Feldenkrais method with Jeff Haller, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and just, she's an expert on all things nervous system. So I'm, I'm really, really excited uh, and would like to learn more from Irene. Um, Irene, yeah. would you mind telling us a little bit more about your story with the Feldenkrais yeah. method and how you came to it? Sure, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, so I, I originally, um, my undergraduate degree, when I was young in my 20s, was uh, exercise science and biomedical science and exercise rehabilitation. So I got into that work because I had uh, a keen interest in helping my own body recover from a knee injury when I was um, in my teens, ski racing. Actually, I live in Canada. So was into skiing and all that, and got into exercise science, loved it, loved it so much, um, and then ended up getting more injuries due to my um, knee and my risky adrenaline behaviors as a teenager and as a young 20-year-old woman. Um, and what happened was I had a weird complication from an ACL, an anterior cruciate ligament repair, where my, my patella, my kneecap, fractured, broken half spontaneously one day walking down the stairs. And um, it was quite the shock, still to this day, probably the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life. And um, had to get that fixed, repaired, you know, screws and pins and wires, had it taken out. Um, and I was recovering from that surgery as well as a, an ACL repair. It was the ACL repair that, that killed the integrity of the patella. Anyway, I was recovering and I wasn't, even though I was strong and fit and all the muscles were back in place, I was in a lot of chronic tension, a lot of pain. Um, and I was seeing a physical therapist. I was doing all my exercise, rehab exercises that I had spent seven years learning at university and something just wasn't right. And finally, my physical therapist, this was in Australia at the time, I was doing some research there. Uh, just south of Sydney in a town called Wollongong. Um, my physical therapist was like, I don't know what, I don't know what's wrong. Cause he was great. He was doing all the right things. And I was stretching and doing my exercises and everything that I thought I should be doing. He said, let's, I want you to go see a colleague of mine who also practices this stuff called Feldenkrais. So I, that's how I got into Moshe's work. It was in 2000 um, in Australia. I literally took a train and walked up a hill and went to this old, you know, run down place where I saw this guy, uh, Jerry Burns was his name or is his name. And he did what I guess was an FI. At the time, I didn't know what the heck I was getting into. All I know is I, I laid down on this table. It was an old psych hospital. So they had these really crazy beds. And I just think I fell asleep, to be honest. Um, because I was doing grad work, I was teaching, I was running a study, I was dealing with this body of mine that wasn't working, um, but it helped. And he sent me home with a cassette tape and he was like, do side A, and then the next day do side B, and then the next day side A and B, and just repeat that for a week. And then once you've done those two things, at this, at the, they were awareness through movement lessons, um, come back to me and we'll do a, a little more. And so I said, okay, I stopped doing all my rehab. I stopped doing all the stretching. I kept up with aerobic fitness. And within a month, my whole system was completely different. Like it was the miracle that we call Feldenkrais a miracle, but to me, it was just learning. Now I know what I know. It wasn't a miracle. It's just how the body's supposed to move. And um, I never went to a class. I only think I saw him maybe three times. And I kept doing those tapes over and over again. And then I got back to Canada 
and decided to look into it. And about four or five months prior or after that, um, Jeff Haller was starting a Feldenkrais training in my home province of British Columbia and I signed up. And that was kind of my first entry into the non-academic world of learning how to work with the human body. Um, loved it, completely shifted everything in my system, started a private practice, was quite successful with that, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was one summer in 2008 where I realized that even the stuff that I had learned through Jeff and Jeff was a fantastic teacher and I was quite skilled at what I was doing. Even all the good work that was working for a large chunk of my private practice, it wasn't working with another chunk of people. And I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. And it wasn't that I was doing anything wrong. I was missing a piece that I hadn't yet learned. Kind of like when I was doing exercise science, Feldenkrais was the, the first piece I went into. And then it was this next piece, which was understanding how um, traumatic stress gets trapped within not just our nervous system, but our entire physiology and how we interact with the world. And so that um, one thing led to another, and it was actually Alice Friedman, who is another Feldenkrais practitioner. She's an assistant trainer. Um, she was the one who mentioned somatic experiencing and Peter Levine, she had studied that work. And so I looked it up and it just was like, this is it. So I went and studied in um, California in SoCal uh, Encinitas with Steve Hoskinson, who was one of Peter Levine's main protégés. Did that from 2008 to 2010 for the basic training. And then I just kind of went as far as you could go in that realm, um, minus becoming a trainer of the work. Um, and then the, the last thing, cause I need to get credit, to give credit to all my teachers is, uh, so I, list, I learned with Steve, learned a lot with Peter, did all of his mass, most of his master classes, started assisting at that level. Um, and then I started learning with a woman by the name of Kathy Kane. And Kathy is also a um, somatic experiencing trainer, teacher, practitioner. Um, and she's also trained in something called orthobionomy. She actually wrote the book on orthobionomy, which is working from a very gentle osteopathic point of view with the tissues of the body. Um, and her interest was in chronic um, illness, uh, fibromyalgia, early trauma, developmental trauma, birth trauma, and utero trauma, working with systems that had what we would call pre-verbal trauma. So before we cognitively can make sense of what's going on. And that was another massive opening into this other layer of the human system and how it really it's so complex and it just opened up another world to complement everything else that I had done. So I would say that from, from a body perspective, mind, body, neuroplasticity perspective is that, that evolution to where I am today. So hopefully that wow. <laughs> covers it all. That's a lot, yeah. That's a lot yeah. of different fields um, yeah. all joined together. Um, so I'm curious, you know, we bring up this topic sort of a bit unusual, I would say, that people don't usually associate Feldenkrais method and sexuality mm -hmm. uh, or states of nervous system and sexuality. So mm -hmm. how would how would you explain the connection? With um, the nervous With system the, and sexuality? The nervous, yes, the nervous system and sexuality. Yeah, I mean, it's, kind of, it's there's so many topics because a, that the word sex is sort of taboo in a strange way when really sex, we could say is male, female, however you want to call it. Um, if I think about the little that I learned um, within the Feldenkrais method and Moshe's working through Jeff and reading um, all of his readings or all of his writings was that, that sexuality or sexual maturity is the last thing, or I should say sexuality is the last thing to mature in a human being. Um, from my understanding. And I would say that that's pretty accurate. And I will also say coupled to that is emotional maturity, relational maturity and maturity with self. Um, and what I've learned through the studies with um, Peter and, and Kathy within the somatic experiencing world when we are living in a state of dysregulation so when there is trapped 
traumatic stress, when we are not aware of blind spots, if you will, in our somatic physiology and how we interact with the world, we aren't mature as, as human beings, as human souls, however you want to call the human. And it limits our ability to be truly not just sexual, but creative. They kind of go hand in hand, right? So, um, and everyone's a little different, just like every human is creative in their own way. I think everyone has different flavors and ways in which they express their sexuality. We're different than the animals in the wild, right? We often compare ourselves to that, that animal uh, nature and we are, but then we also have this human thing that has this brain going for us that's way different than most other mammals out there. So there's the sexuality from the, the point of view of um, procreation and needing to perpetuate the species. And then there's other, then there's this other thing, which is pleasure and, and being with one and their own sensuality. And to me, it's not just sex per se, it's life force energy. It's that chi, it's that, that prana, that energy that kind of not to bring a star wars reference in but i will it's like it's the it's the universal field of energy that's there for all of us but from what i've seen when we're not tuned into our our entire physiology and that electricity in a way it's it's hard to tap into that energy and then feel it within ourselves i hope i'm making sense with that yeah i would just would like maybe for you to define the dysregulated state of nervous system so our viewers could get a clear right. idea of what well it's a it's um there's sort of two sides to that so to to define the dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system i will define first the autonomic nervous system so and then we have before that the whole nervous system branches so we have our central nervous system which is the brain and the spinal cord and then we have the peripheral nervous system which literally means the periphery so it's the nerves coming out of the brain and the spinal cord and so the autonomic nervous system part of the peripheral is there's two portions one is the sympathetic nervous system and the other is the parasympathetic nervous system um, to make it real simple, sympathetic is often classified as the fight flight, right? So um, if, if uh, a, a bird, there's a window right here in front of me, if a bird was to, you know, run into the window, I might startle and look, even though we're talking here, my automatic reaction will, might protect or startle. That's that fight flight kind of action taking place without a conscious element, it's completely unconscious. Same of, um, you know, we use the crazy example of the mother uh, pulls the car off of her child, you know, that's adrenaline and energy just, you know, saving, saving her little one. It's also if we are being attacked, um, if we are being attacked or we're being in any way um, harmed, there is an impulse to protect, to fight, to flee, to get away. If we can't, so if we look at just from a survival point of view, if we can't get away, if we can't fight, if we're too small to fight, right? If we're an infant and we're on an operating table getting operated on because we have a tumor somewhere, we don't have the faculties to rip those. We, we're, we might try, but we don't have the strength. So I say these examples because sometimes there's this notion that, that dysregulation only happens due to big, scary, not that surgery when we're little isn't scary, but things like attacks, sexual trauma, war, natural disasters, but it can also be being held down at the dentist when we're five years old, right? Not wanting to sit there and they pull us down while they yank a tooth out and we're wanting to punch that dentist and we're wanting to get out of the chair. Our survival physiology is going up, but then we can't. And so we then go into the freeze portion so fight flight is more sympathetic or is sympathetic nervous system <clears throat> freeze is part of the parasympathetic now this is where it gets tricky is the parasympathetic isn't just freeze it's also rest digest and it's also what we would call ventral vagal it's social engagement and that's where part of the story gets missed is we just say oh parasympathetic is rest digest that's partially it's a third true it's also our ability for me to like us to look at each other. And if I make funny faces to you, 
you know, you're going to maybe feel that. And I'm like, come on, let's play and, and make funny faces. And that's that ventral vagal. Um, but it's also the rest digest that repairs the gut, the immune system, et cetera, et cetera. So when we think of the autonomic nervous system and the sympathetic, parasympathetic, basically we want these systems to work together. So let's just say that bird doesn't fly in, but it startles me. If I stay hyper alert, waiting for something to come through the window again, it's going to be very hard for us or for me to stay in my higher brain and connect to you and think there might be dozens, hundreds of people watching this, right? I might, and I'm just going to act right now, this isn't real, but I might just keep being distracted, waiting for something to come. That is a sign of our system or my system still being hypervigilant to potential threat. Like, oh, oh gosh, there's a window there. What if it comes through there and all these sorts of things? It won't allow me to fully be in my cognitive brain. It won't allow me to sense the nuances of things. Um, it'll, it'll just, it won't be good, right? It'll be distracting. We want to come back down. We want to come out of that fight flight. Now, let's just say, I've got to paint this picture a little bit. Let's just say um, someone does get distracted by that bird. Let's just say, pretend, you know, I get distracted. There's lots of reasons for that. And it could be that maybe in the past I was hit by a bird or I had a soccer ball come to my head or someone hit me in that direction or um, anything that is a threat that comes out of left field, literally out of our periphery and we never resolve that stressor, that traumatic event, our system can and often will stay hypervigilant waiting for something. Or the flip side is we become tunnel visioned. And we, does that make sense? And we stop looking, we stop orienting because the world is a dangerous place. So I'm not gonna look at it and I'm just gonna be like this. And so that's one example of how a stressor, an old traumatic thing, can get stuck in our system if we fail to come out of that, that aroused, activated, traumatic state. In terms of dysregulation, we would say then that me, Irene, being hypervigilant, I am in a dysregulated state. I am not here in my body talking with you. I'm worried about the thing hitting my head. Um, the other thing about dysregulation that I didn't mention is that the autonomic nervous system is responsible for the fight, flight, freeze, and these nervous system responses to threat and danger, as well as interaction with others and the environment, as well as rest, digest. So when we are chilling at night, watching a show, reading a book, sleeping, we want to go into this rest, digest world, right? That's what rejuvenates us and repairs us. And so if I have my cup of tea here, right, if I take a sip, I don't have to think about that going into my stomach and, and pulling out the, the, the liquid when it's in my large intestine. It just happens. It's automatic. Same with the immune system, same with our reproductive physiology, our cardiovascular, everything. And so if I am living in a state of dysregulation due to the fight, flight, freeze being all wacky and out of, out of, you know, out of sync, my internal systems like the digestion, the immune system, the reproduction, the hormone release from all the various glands in the body, it will be in disarray, it'll be chaotic. It can either be hyper or hypo. And this is where um, I wanna make the bridge because I know a lot of people who come to the Feldenkrais method have chronic illnesses, autoimmune, pain, anxiety, depression, poor circulation, poor blood pressure, you know, all these things. Um, and so I wanted to make that bridge because having that fight, flight, freeze be, our, be what runs the front of our bus, so to speak, be what runs our physiology will not only make us hypervigilant or shut down, it'll also impact the, the whole physiological system. So that is a very long way of saying dysregulation is when we have this cycling of sympathetic arousal, 
with parasympathetic shutdown happening at the same time. I'm going to give you one more piece. Yeah. That depends or how a person as an adult goes into that dysregulation is very much determined by what occurred to them when they were young. So how we were wired in the first three years of our life in utero, we know now transgenerationally, trauma follows us if there isn't a stop in the cycle of the family system. Um, but if someone was born into a relatively safe family and mom and dad like each other and they get along and they're mature and their expression and their interaction and their sexuality and their creativity um, and they're not harboring old stuff in their system, and this is a big, you know, hypothetical, um, they're, they'll raise kiddos who have fairly good regulation. That person that gets better regulation early on, they may have a stressor in life, like a car accident or an attack even, but they'll bounce back faster because the wiring that occurred within their autonomic nervous system was just a little stronger. They learned self-regulation. They understood that it was okay to be expressive and feel and sense. Um, parents didn't carry shame and all those things that transfer to the little one just basically without even knowing it. So depending on how our early upbringing was, it will determine um, how our adult years, our teenage years will be. Um, someone who doesn't have that safety, someone who maybe, it, and it doesn't have to be abuse. Again, it could be a kiddo that's been through multiple surgeries, right? I've seen this in my practice, all the love in the world, but they're in and out of that hospital. That's not good. Even adopted kids or infants who go into a very loving home, if they experienced an in utero milieu and that that separation from the birth mother, that is also a trauma, even if they're going into a very loving environment. I mean, there's so many examples there. So um, why was I saying that? So depending on our, our early time as a human being will determine how resilient and self-regulated we are later in life. And so dysregulation is a very large topic because it could mean in the moment I've become a little dysregulated because I have a stressful thing happening but then I can feel into my body and I can sense it. So I can, I can um, rectify it by sensation, by emotion, by getting support. And then for some, that dysregulation has been there from the beginning. And they often people, and I'm being very hypothetical in general here, they don't even know they're in it because they haven't known any other way of life, right? It was just normal to see parents who were fighting or parents who were shut down to each other or it was normal to not express, to hold in all the tears or to only see anger. And so if you only know that, you don't know that there's this other way of living that is with regulation, that is, is with harmony and flow. Um, so I will pause and, and just check in with you there if that has answered that question. Yeah, it, it did. And, and it seems like what you're saying is, <clears throat> it's like, you know, when people try to you know, lose weight or get healthy with their physical body, you know, they address all these foundational things like yes. diet, exercise, lifestyle. So the same seems to be the case with sexuality in order for you to truly connect to yourself and to another and to be playful, right? Which we consider parts of being sexual um, is you need to first address that foundation, your nervous system state. A hundred percent. I mean, that's a good example with diet and exercise because a lot of people that that I see or that I've been in contact with, they have tried everything. You know, they've tried the food change, learning, uh, having a routine. But if that internal spark, if that internal locus, we would say, of control to to improve oneself because they just know they want to, if that isn't there these things tend to fall off, right? It's an, an external drive is pushing it. It's the media, it's the spouse, it's the family system, it's the community. And that can get us to a certain point, right? Without a doubt, but this is why people fall off the wagon, right? With all sorts of behavior changes. It's not 
based in that natural instinct. Animals in the wild, again, they instinctually know how to find their food, you know, and they're not exercising because they're just active in the, in the, in the environment that is the wild. Whereas we're, we're weird, right? We've got, we're, we're not, we're, we're, we need that kind of vigor and that kind of hunting and gathering and, and hunt, you know, but we, we don't need it in the same way. And so that energy expenditure, that, that, that life force energy to survive and drive our survival basically is less important. It's important, but it's not there. In terms of sexuality, uh, what's interesting when it comes to trauma being trapped, and I like to call it survival stress more so than trauma because a trauma can affect two people very differently, right? One person can be fine because they were resilient growing up and had a good solid base of nervous system regulation, whereas someone can have the exact same accident and be a mess afterwards. Um, so I like to say survival stress, but if they're, what's interesting with sexuality is someone can be highly sexual and very, very um, able to perform, if we want to call it that, and be highly dysregulated. And someone can be very regulated, but creative and using their juice and energy and other pursuits and not be dysregulated and not be as driven. So individuality, I think, is really important when it comes to this. And then the other thing that I'll mention, and then maybe we can branch off into a topic that you want to get into, is in having worked with people who have been, um, who have survived, say, sexual abuse, sexual um, traumas, if we call it that, just because they have been hurt in that world, in that act, in that interaction with another human, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not able to be in a sexual relationship. But the thing that's interesting is, are they even, are they aware of their bodies? And often, and again, I'm, this is a huge generalization, so I can't talk of every scenario, but more often than not, um, a person is in a functional freeze they're in a bit of a shutdown. They're actually disconnected from their body. So they need a lot of arousal, a lot of vigor to get that sexual response going. It's kind of like people that are, um, and I was this person who was quite numbed out, um, not due to abuse, but due to other things, um, just society in general. And I loved adrenaline sports. I needed to to fly off of mountains and ski down large cliffs, you know, to feel energy in my body. Um, we also find that people will go to extremes in sports and other things, career, to actually feel alive when the reason they're doing it often is because their system is so shut down. And so this is where there's not a one size all. Um, so I'll, I'll end there and then let me know if you have any follow ups to that. Well, I'm just curious, what are the real life strategies to um, improving that kind of state of numbness or dysregulation for people who are having, you know, struggles? Yeah. Or, you know, just life in general. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because um, in the work that I've done specifically with um, Peter Levine and Kathy Kane, while we will um, talk about, say, sexual healing and sexual trauma, at the end of the day, the, the, I don't like to say protocol, but the entry point, the way in which we start to work with someone is no different than if they came in with a surgical a trauma or a car accident, because the, because the system is basically looking for safety. The system wants to find safety. It wants to find connection. It wants to know that it can let down the guard, that hypervigilance. And so one of the first things that isn't actionable with the somatic system is education. So because of our higher brain and because of this physiology that is often running the front of our bus without us even realizing it, to first learn the depth of what the nervous system is, how things get wired, can start the process of somebody starting to spark up because our memories might go, oh gosh, that's right. I remember that happening and I was completely dissociated. 
or I remember after that happened, all I was was rageful. All I wanted was to kill someone and it made no sense. So to understand how the survival stress, those fight, flight, freeze um, capabilities in our body, how they have worked with us, for us, against us, maybe they didn't come up when they needed to. That's um, if I think about sexual trauma from a specific point of view or sexual abuse, often people will say, I, um, I couldn't, I didn't move. I couldn't, I couldn't protect myself. And there's a lot of shame around that, but actually going into shutdown is protective, right? It can be protective because then you're not risking yourself to becoming in, in more danger, for example. But when a person then is realizing, I want to heal this traumatic event, this thing that occurred to me that, that, that wasn't good and was very scary, the next thing after the education is to start to remember, so literally reconnect with the body. And that's where things can get tricky because I've again worked with people who the moment they feel their pelvis or they touch their skin, they will, and again, generalization, they'll either feel fear, terror, they may feel disgusted, they may want to throw up because they've been completely disconnected from this physical system. I've seen people physically want to vomit the moment they reconnect to their body. And then what happens if you don't understand and you don't have the education on board is you think, well, this, this Feldenkrais class or this mindfulness class or this yoga class or this therapy session, it must be wrong because if this was healing, I wouldn't feel like I want to puke, right? And so that desire to want to vomit is the emotion disgust, which is one of the primal basic mammalian emotions, which we harbor inside of us when something has happened to us that hasn't been nice. It's not that we're disgusted at ourselves, we're disgusted at what happened to us. And so being able to understand these cellular biological emotions that get stuck within us is super important. So that when they come, whether it's that or rage or grief, whatever it might be, that we are like, oh, this is that thing that I need to feel. And then from there, um, being able to stay contained, being able to stay connected. Um, there's a word, have you heard of the word catharsis or cathartic practices? The trouble with those, and that's like an example would be just getting a baseball bat and hitting something, pretending that's, you know, your abuser or the surgery, the surgeon that, you know, helped you, but it hurt you. The problem with just taking something like a bat and hitting is you're not integrating the full biological, emotional, situational experience. All it is, is hitting. So there's nothing wrong, for instance, with hitting and getting that or, or pushing or fighting or whatever it might be, but we want it to connect with the sensation, maybe the memory, but there might not be a memory, but definitely with the sensation and that life force energy in a way that is, it could be big, but it has to be contained. And so by contained, I mean, can you witness as you're hitting I'm here in this place. It's uh, whatever February, whatever day it is. Um, this is my house. This is my person that I'm with. If we disconnect from the here and now while going through a cathartic event, we're, we're not, from what I've experienced, we're not going to fully heal and integrate that past event. It will just, we could say re-traumatize or just get stuck back into the system. So the reason I mentioned the ability to be contained and stay in the here and now is some of the foundational work that we want to do is real basic stuff. Can you feel your feet on the floor? Can you sense your pelvis on the ground? And that's where Feldenkrais is wonderful. It asks the questions of awareness through movement in the environment. The thing that has to be understood, however, is that depending on the person, their capacity might be that small. And so sometimes these, these traditional ways, if it's an hour long class or it's an hour long session, they don't work when there's a lot of held traumatic stress in the system. Five minutes might be all a person can handle. 
right? And again, this is where that education comes in. Because if a person understands, oh, this is, this is that thing. I'm, I can feel my feet. I can roll my pelvis. All, but now my heart's starting to race. And all I want, it's starting to, things are starting to kind of spin. And I guess I should stay here and breathe and connect and keep going. And that's where I would say, no, don't keep going because your system has literally like reached its capacity that the cup is full. And if we try to put more in it, it's just gonna, it's just gonna overflow or break. And so that's where the education is important. And, and the personal power of saying, if you only do five minutes, that's great. And if those five minutes are contained and you're with the body and the emotions and the environment, then that's enough for the day. And so our world of mind body work doesn't always suit that, if that makes sense. Well, I, I see what you're saying. And it's actually interesting because that actually requires a basic awareness of your physical body. A hundred percent. Emotional state, right? And that not everyone has that or not everyone has ability not to push through, which our society usually requires us is to push through. Uh, and so that is, I see in my classes too, you know, as I teach classes, it's some people after years have difficulty stopping at that discomfort, you know, level. hundred percent. I, I agree a hundred percent, Yulia. And that's, that's where I think the, the methods and the structures of how we've created a lot of our mind body classes um they don't recognize this a the complexity but also where a person is at um some people need interaction to feel safe other people interaction is terrifying right so when we think about a group class and you get everybody into a group doing partner work if we haven't done the um, due diligence of teaching those people in that class how to notice when they're starting to override, you then might have a class of people who are not in any way in their bodies and they are definitely not in their cognitive brain and then they're not gonna retain anything, right? Whereas if you can do a little bit of groundwork, I like to call it ground school, right? Like you would never put a person in a plane and say, just drive this plane and take it off. It's, impo it's impossible to do that with something that complex. You need to learn ground school. You need to learn where the buttons are. You need to understand you know, all the checklists that you need to do. And so to be able to kind of uh, re-envision or recreate how we do classes, I think is really important because we're losing a lot of people. Um, we lose a lot of people in how we interact with classes, how we um, push people. And, and there's often a lot of shame. Like if someone can't finish a class, they'll feel terrible because they couldn't get through what everyone else got, right? And the teacher will often say, well, just sit and watch or sit and imagine. But the thing is, is that that can also drive us crazy too because we wanna be participating. Right, so there's so many interesting avenues that you, we can go down with that. But when we can understand how to be with the system and the body and take ownership in that group setting, as we, if we think about a group setting and we allow the people in the class to be adults, be mature, right? This comes back to that emotional maturity, but also having the teacher be emotionally mature because I've seen in many classes, teachers will kind of ridicule and make fun of people who can't push through, right? And that's not cool, right? So again, this it's like, it comes both ways. There needs to be kind of um, a contract, if you will, agreed upon that we're all adults here and you have to take care of yourself. And someone coming to say a class, it doesn't have to be a Feldenkrais class, a yoga class, whatever, they just show up for five minutes and they're like, that's enough, I'm leaving. And they've done that with their own life force energy. To me, that's a bigger win than staying for the full class and going into survival mode or going into more survival mode, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. giving yourself permission, right? That's hard. hundred yeah. percent. And if we don't, if we don't, you know, if we don't layer that learning, it's just not beneficial for the person. It's not beneficial for the teacher. It's kind of like, I always go back to teaching children. If a, if a kid can't learn how to read and write in a matter of a week, we're not going to tell them, well, don't come back. 
right? They have to slowly in their own time, figure it out. And obviously with support from the caregiver, the parent, the teacher, but you're not gonna stop them from learning because all they can do is 10 minutes that day. And yet we've kind of structured these systems such that it has to be this, 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 and this. Well, it's a commercial, commercial reasons, let's just say that. Totally, <laughs> that's another topic. Yeah, but well, I guess um, just one last question, which interests me. Um, it's kind of a, you know, a bit controversial to speak about sexuality and aging. Mm. I'm just curious, what do you have to say about that? That is, you know, we all want to be kind of a fully uh, mm -hmm. accomplished people as we age and, and fully functional people as we age. So um, yeah, I think sexuality is part of it. it, it uh, here's the thing, I haven't aged, <laughs> I may, I've aged, but because I'm not in that category of, we would say aged, <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know if I have the right to talk to that, but I will say this. Um, if we think of everything that we've just talked about in terms of being able to stay in the moment, utilizing our creative life force energy, that root chakra energy, the pelvis, you know, where all those organ juices are and, and everything in the system, we know that as we age hormones shift, right? It's just part of it. And so is, is sexual energy as we age about the act itself or is it, is it about pleasure? Is it about sensuality? Is it about being intimate? Is it about being able to express the body in the way that we want it to express? I mean, I would say that most of the time, and I'm again, huge generalization, as we age, there's this accepted notion that we decline in function. And one of the, th actually, when I was studying my research in Australia, I was studying the aged population and exercise. So putting old people like old 65 to 85 through really intense strength training, like heavy, heavy weight lifting with their legs. And the research in that area was very conclusive that even at age 85, the muscle can grow back. The, 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 the muscle mass and the strength of the muscle can improve like crazy. But we've given this sort of sentence to let's say an, the aged human or as we age, that as you age, you should get slower and you should do less. And, and it's just not the case right? Some say that their best creative works occurred when they were retired, when they were at their, their golden years. So if I just extrapolate from that, I would say, based on me not experiencing it myself, that, that yes, we can have an amazing sexual maturity and connection at that age. And it also depends on the rest of our health, right? Um, and of course, if we have a partner, if we don't have a partner, how we express that either solo or with someone else, is it safe in our relationship? I didn't really mention that, but a lot of relationships, while they're nice and civil, is there an actual cellular safety with that other human being, if we think of like a partnership? And as I talk and as I listen to couples and friends, it really amazes me how many couples are not connected. They are afraid to go to the bathroom with the door open, for example, you know? Um, so one of the things I forgot to mention when you asked, so how do you start to fix it? This dysregulation is connecting back to our basic biological impulses. So are we able to listen to our digestion? Are we able to listen to our bladder when it's full? Are we listen, able to listen to the pressure in our rectum when we have to take a bowel movement? Are we resting when we're tired? Are we forcing ourselves to do something when we don't want to? So this ability to listen to this physiology of ours, I think is very important as a way to be intimate with ourselves. I think if we can't be intimate with ourselves, it's very hard to be intimate with another human being. And if we can't show those biological functions with our primary partner, 
I'm not sure how one can be fully able to let go with that partner, no matter what age you are at. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's so funny. I had to say this. I just thinking of a show that came into my mind that was quite popular in the nineties called sex in the city. It was an American show. And there was this one episode where the main character, Carrie Bradshaw was mortified because she passed gas <laughs> in front of her, her boyfriend. And she created this story that basically he doesn't want to be with her and have sex with her anymore because she farted. And it was like, Jesus, you just, and, and when, you know, some friends were like, oh yeah, it's over. The sex is over. And this other friend was like, you farted, you're human. You're allowed to do that. And then she played this story in her mind about how expressing that biology was going to kill that. So we could say, if we dissect that episode, that is not emotional maturity. That is not sexual maturity. That's not biological maturity. So and, yeah, yes. And <laughs> it goes into much more complicated spheres yeah. of gender roles and expectations. So yeah. Sure, sure. So it's kind of like, um, I think that if we can be truly biological in our bodies with the person that we're with, or even with ourself, you know, if we're ashamed of our own bodily expressions, that is a to me, that's a primary place to start pre getting into improving the sexual, because that is going to improve the sexual energy and that ability to fully express at this, at that level. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is really excellent. I, I'm so glad that we did this. I don't <laughs> want to let you go, but I know you're very busy. Um, but it was such a joy to speak to you. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for sharing. Well, thank you. Irene. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.